Okay. Good evening, everyone. In fact, good afternoon to delegates joining us from Brazil. Uh, a very warm welcome to these virtual seminars on international convention on oil pollution and their applicability in recent cases. The event has been organized by the London Shipping Law Center, YMP, in association with the Brazilian Bar Association, OAB. Um, thank you once again for joining us. I'm delighted to see so many delegates registered and logging to this to tonight. And for those who don't know me, uh, I am Francesca Kappa. I am an English qualified. I work at MFB in London. And as you can probably tell, I'm originally from Italy. I'm currently chairing the YMP Association in London. So before we begin, um, let me just say a few words uh, about the YMP, as some of today's delegates may not be familiar with us. Um, as many of you know, we are part of the London, the London Shipping Law Center, an association fund, founded by Dr. Aleka Shepard as a specialist center of excellence for the advancement of shipping law and maritime business. The London Shipping Law Center brings together professionals from um, the practice of maritime law, uh, maritime commerce, the judiciary, academia, maritime organization, as well as students um, for the knowledge exchange, development of professional skills and business. The YMP uh, specifically aim at the younger generation in shipping, and we welcome members from all areas of the industry, from students with an interest in shipping uh, to established professionals. The YMP aims to promote cross-sector networking, education, exchange of knowledge, um, ideas, and uh, further professional development. We run regular networking and educational events uh, that may range from evening panel discussion, short talks, on-site visits, and sometimes just purely social events. Of course, for sometimes we've been operating online due to the COVID pandemic, but one of the sil silver linings of the pandemic and switching to running events virtually is that we've been able to work um, with associations all over the world internationally and attracts delegates from all corners of the world. It has been a great pleasure for us working on this event with our colleagues in Brazil as part of their effort to expand our international network. So thank you to them for engaging with us and working so hard with us to put together this seminar. Uh, thank you to all the speakers this evening for their time, efforts they, they've put in providing informative presentations. We all know how much time and effort um, goes in preparing this. So let me now, I will, I, I will now go into introducing the speakers. Um, see if I can. Oops, here we are. So the first speaker is Lucas Leite Marquez. Uh, many of us will know him. He's a partner at Kim Cade Mendes Bian Avogados. Um, his expertise lies in maritime law, oil and gas litigation and arbitration. He's a professor of maritime law at FGV um, and RJ is the former vice president of the Transport Law Commission of the International Association of Young Lawyers, is the, is the director of maritime and port law of the Brazilian Center for Mediation and Arbitration, is a member of the Brazilian Maritime Law Association, is a member of the Maritime and Port Law Commission of the Brazilian Bar Association in Rio de Janeiro and Sao Paulo. And of course, this is just a summary of the bios of the speakers, which um, the delegates will have, have already received by emails uh, from, from us. Ingrid Zanella Andrade Campos, again, many of us will know her. Um, she's a partner as Kiros Cavalcanti Avocaccia, um, apologies for my pronunciation. Um, with ex she, her expertise lies in maritime, port and environmental law. Um, she advises organization of the sector of the industry, oil and gas company, energy, port, and terminals. She's the vice president of the Bar Association of Pernambuco, uh, president of the Maritime Port and Oil and Law Committee of the uh, Bar Association in Pernambuco, and member of the National Maritime and Port Law Committee of the Federal Bar Association. She's also 
uh, permanent professor of maritime law at the Federal University of Pernambuco. And she has been recognized officer of the Order of Na Naval Merit at the Brazilian Navy. The third speaker is Celso de Azevedo. He's a barrister at 36 um, Group. Um, he has over 20 years' experience. He, he advises uh, in all sorts of uh, complex and high value international reinsurance, shipping, cybersecurity, data breach, fraud, and commercial disputes. He is also a qualified, he's also a qualified New York attorney and is a fellow of the Charter Institute of Arbitrators. Um, Celso is a panelist to serve as an arbitrator and mediator also of the Fed ARB, um, the ADR institution in the US. And finally, uh, Renata Benning, um, she um, has practiced law in Brazil for three years at Trigueiro Fontes Avogados. Um, she, gra after graduating from the Universitade Católica di Pernambuco in 2012, uh, she has been working with God since February 2017. Uh, she started off as a deputy claim executive and she has been promoted since January 2018 as a claim executive. Um, she uh, handled claims from different areas, mainly cargo collision, and of course, she specialized in pollution. Now that I've given just given a brief overview of the speakers, uh, I I just I would just like to uh, talk about the event format. The event has been designed as in with an interactive format. Um, the speakers will address four questions, and here are the questions. Um, we will then, um, what we will do is that during the presentation, you can write comments and questions in the Q&A. And after the speakers have given their individual presentation, we will look at the question and ask panelists to address them. Uh, please make sure that uh, you include your name so that we can invite you to read your questions uh, after the speakers have, have concluded their presentations. One last point uh, to note is that, of course, the speaker today are here in their personal capacity and any views uh, is actually their own views and doesn't really reflect uh, the ones of their organizations. So now, before I hand over to Lucas, I think the first question, um, hold on, let me, oops. Presentation is actually gone, let me put this back. So we should, I, I will hand over to Lucas to deal with the first questions on what are the legal and practic practical remedies for fighting all pollution available in the UK and Brazilian jurisdiction, which convention are in effect in each jurisdiction. And I, will, I shall now hand, hand over to Lucas to deal with the first questions. Many thanks, Francesca. It is a pleasure to be here uh, with uh, such a, a selective audience uh, and also to participate on the YMP event. Um, as a start, uh, as this will be an interactive session and we'll be hearing from uh, very, uh, a lot of uh, experts uh, from uh, Brazil and the UK, uh, I would bring uh, in a way that, so that we can answer the questions, uh, comments on a, a very uh, relevant pollution incident that we had in Brazil a couple of years ago. Uh, by August, by mid-August of 2019, uh, pieces of oil uh, and stains started to appear in some of uh, the beaches uh, on the Brazilian coast, especially in the northeast coast of the country. Uh, and during a period of approximately four months, uh, that uh, the, the appearance of uh, pollution uh, was uh, very intense. And even after that, uh, stains and pollution spots were seen in the coast, but uh, during the four initial months, it started appearing uh, in, in several places. In the end, uh, it was, uh, th there were over 3,600 kilometers of beaches in the Brazilian coasts hit with pollution uh, in an area that covered 11 different states. And we have in Brazil, Brazil is a, a country of uh, continental size, and we have 17 states with uh, a coastline 
11 of those states were hit by the pollution incident, a total of 130 cities, and there were over 17,000 public personnel from different bodies, entities, and authorities engaged. And I'm not counting the, the private par parties and people that went also to help clean up the beaches. Uh, over 25 aircrafts were engaged, 44 ships, 25 land vehicles, uh, and 47 academic institutions with uh, hundreds of researchers were engaged to try to find out the source and how to deal with that uh, pollution incident. Uh, in the end, uh, investigations uh, unfortunately did not locate the source, although the, the Navy did a, a good job in narrowing it down uh, where was uh, uh, the pollution should have started uh, at around 700 kilometers away from the Brazilian coasts. They identified that this was a heavy crude oil uh, of similar nature uh, of the one produced in Venezuela, but was probably being carried by a ship. Uh, and the oil navigated or drift with, along with the current and the tide for over one month, uh, submerged before it reached the shore. And only when the oil reached the shore that it emerges and you can see and you can identify. So it was a terrible incident. Uh, sources uh, was not identified. And I, I think Ingrid may add something also about the event because she is the, directly involved in, in some of the uh, actions that were taken in Pernambuco, which is the state she represents uh, in fighting that incident. So I think it's a uh, one case example that we would like to bring here to the discussion so that we can then proceed with the, the questions and the debates. Thank you very much, Lucas, for passing me the word. Uh, first of all, yeah, I'm very glad to be here sharing experience and knowledge with you all. Thank you very much, Francesca, for the nice introduction. I'm sure this will be a unique seminar for changing experience. Since Lucas said before, uh, it's important to mention that here our country is a highly privileged maritime country. We have a coastline with 8.5 thousand, thousand navigable, navigable kilometers. So we have extended coasts. So of course you need to be more concerned about liabilities, incidents, even with oil polluter. Uh, and we have here by the Navy an increase of the number of the incidents because we are aiming to open the market for the navigation here in Brazil. In September of 2019, we have a unique and a very challenging case for several reasons. First of all, we didn't know the source. Until now, we don't know the source of the pollution. We don't have any information about that. Where is the source? Where is the oil coming from? So, of course, you need to be in an incident. We need to search for liables, for, for responsibles, for everyone who can help. In this case, we didn't even know who was the liable until now. And, and the, sad, the sad news is that the, the oil are still reaching our coast. Here in Northeast, where I live, in Brazil, we are still, we are still reaching uh, the oils are still reaching our coast and we are still worried about what we should do because we don't know until now the source of pollution. Since Lucas said, like Lucas said, we have for, for us to have a concrete idea about the widespread of the damage, we have a lot of states, we have more than nine states of Northeast who was uh, suffer with damage, environmental damage, more than two states of South East, almost five tons of crude oil was collected from the beach. It wasn't a small incident, it was a huge incident. More than uh, uh, one, 117 cities was contaminated by oil. And of course, we have a lot of damage in tourism, hotels, economic, uh, economic aspects here in Brazil, a lot of sectors. When you talk about liability, of course, you're going to talk about it in the seminar further. But in this case, when you talk about liability, we know that in the incident, a lot of group arises. We talk about agency, charter, port, terminals, cargo owner. Since we didn't know where 
the oil are coming from, who was liable for the damage, we need to put all the liability on the states and the environmental bodies to deal with it. To deal with it. That's why it's so important to talk about containment plans, effective plans to contain the pollution in the maritime incidents like that. But it was a challenging case, a unique case, because we didn't know much about it. And until now, Lucas, we didn't know the source, where the oil is coming from, and why we did. That's one of the reasons that Brazil has suffered a lot to contain the, the oil pollution. We're going to talk about this case uh, further in this seminar, of course, because it's a leading case. But I'm sure about experience like that, Celso has something to add. Uh, Celso, could you please help us here? Yes, uh, thank you very much, Ingrid. And uh, thanks, uh, everybody in the uh, Shipping Law Center for the invitation, the OAB for the invitation to speak. Um, as uh, Lucas was uh, explaining, um, and Ingrid, uh, we, we, we thought that the first thing we should do is uh, to, to uh, for comparative purposes, um, uh, you know, give two examples of uh, uh, major oil uh, spill incidents. Uh, in, in one that was uh, subject to the international regime and uh, the Brazilian recent one uh, that is not subject to the international regime because Brazil is not a signatory of the convention. And, and the uh, example that we chose was the case of the prestige. And the prestige is still a very, uh, you know, uh, current topic because only last week uh, on Friday was the last day of a five day hearing uh, in the Court of Appeal in, in England uh, of uh, matters relating to, to, to the prestige. Um, and, um, you know, so it, it, it is something that, uh, even though it started in 2002, it is still very much still uh, a valid and uh, uh, very hot topic. Um, the, the, basically, on the 13th of November, so I'm going to give a very, very, very quick summary of, of the prestige and the main issues. And then we will go back to uh, compa comparing with, with Brazil. Uh, on the 13th of November, 2002, uh, the prestige was carrying about 77 tons of heavy oil, uh, fuel oil and bega began listing and leaking oil some 30 kilometers off Cabo Finisterre in Galicia, Spain. On the 19th of November of 2002, while under tow away from the coast, the vessel uh, broke in two and sunk 260 kilometers west of Vigo in Spain. At the time of the incident, Spain, France, and Portugal were all parties to the 1992 Civil Liability Convention, the CLC, and the 1992 Fund Convention. The, pre the prestige was insured for oil pollution liability with the London PNI Club. The limitation amount applicable to the prestige under the 1992 CLC was approximately 22 million euros. Uh, the maximum amount of compensation under the 1992 CLC and the 1992 Fund Convention was about 171 million euros. Uh, the the um, um, it is interesting because uh, the the case went. Uh, all the way to the Supreme Court. The amount claim, claimed uh, in the proceedings in Spain was about 2.3 billion euros, uh, mainly by the Spanish government, plus claims for moral damage by a number of individuals. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court of Spain in two judgments of 2016 and 2018, and there were amendments in 2019. In summary, the Supreme Court of Spain held that uh, in terms of civil liability, the master of the ship and uh, as a result vicariously the ship owner did not have the right to limit their liability under article 3 roman 3 4 of the 1992 clc because the master had acted recklessly and with knowledge that such loss would probably result which triggered the exception to the limitation of liability under article 5 Point two of the CLC, so that the ship of the master and the ship owner vicariously could not benefit from the limitation of liability established under the CLC. 
but the, interestingly, the Supreme Court uh, recognized that the 92 fund had strict liability and limited its uh, liability in accordance with the 92 convention validly. But more controversially, for today's purposes, in paragraph 69 of the judgment of 1998, the Supreme Court held that the London PMI Club was directly liable under Article 75 of the Insurance Contracts Act to the state of Spain for all the damages caused by the incident, include, including moral and pure, and pure environmental damage up to the limits of its policy limits of 1 billion US dollars. So not, not 140 million uh, odd as, as or 100 and, and um, uh, 70, 70 million odd euros odd uh, as, as uh, provided under the, the 1992 CLC and the 92 convention, but 1 billion US dollars uh, in accordance with the policy limit. And the reason for that was primarily because since the, the master committed a recklessly criminal act, that was a right of direct action against the club with no defenses being available. And in, if you go to paragraph 69 of the Supreme Court's uh, decision, it held that pursuant to Article 117 of the Criminal Code, the higher contractual limits of liability as described in the Charter Party, which referred to the PNI Club Limited of Liability as being 1 billion US dollars, uh, was applicable as it was a contractually agreed compensation envisaged with, within Article 117 of the Criminal Code, and therefore was applicable outside the legal liability set out under the CLC. As you can imagine, there is a lot of controversy in this decision. Um, because the CLC uh, 1992 and the fund uh, were designed to protect the liability of insurers, right, the, 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 the right of liability insurers, such as PMI clubs, to limit uh, their own liability. Uh, and it was supposed to be back to back. Uh, the recklessness of the master may disapply the limitation of liability vis a vis the master or vis a vis the ship owner but it should not interfere with the insurer's right to limit their own liability, which, so it was argued, is made clear under the CLC 1992. That's one side of the argument. On the other hand, other commentators say that the Supreme Court of Spain recognized the limitation of liability of the fund. It recognized that the fund itself was limited to pay up to this limit only, but it simply held so it argued within the CLC regime that the limitation of liability by the ship owner and uh, by way of their extraction, the club fell within the exception of the uh, of Article 5.2 of the CLC due to the recklessness of the master. And as a result, the higher contractual liability of the policy set out under the, in the Charter Party was applicable. Now, in my view, uh, it is implicit in the decision of the Supreme Court of Spain that if there was a lower contractual limit, limited applicable set out in the Charter Party, which referred to the PNI uh, policy, due, which was limited to the limitation of liability of the CLC 92, uh, the Supreme Court considered that the club should have submitted to, has, should have argued the point uh, in, in Spain before the Supreme, the Supreme Court, before the Spanish courts, and it did not do so. So, so goes the argument. In any event, the, the total amount awarded after amendments were made in 1999, uh, sorry, 2019, um, uh, was one, about 1. 1.4 billion euros. Of that is 850 million euros uh, of, of uh, pollution damage. In parallel with the Spanish proceedings, there have been arbitration proceedings in England for declarative relief against the state of Spain and the state of France, and several court proceedings in England to determine whether the awards, the arbitration awards, supersede the Spanish judgments or not. And only last week, for those of you who are interested, you can go to the YouTube channel of the Court of Appeal. And last week, there was a file, you know, Monday to Friday, there was a five day hearing ending on Friday uh, before the Court of Appeal to determine yet more issues arising in this dispute. So this is not the end of the story yet. Uh, but we do not have time to go over these proceedings for today's purposes. Uh, the procedure is simply an illustrative example that 
uh, exemplifies the issues and tensions which may arise under the international conventions regime. I will, I will let uh, Lucas continue with additional questions uh, which are more relevant to today's talk. Lucas. Many thanks, Celso, and I appreciate you bringing the, such a relevant case uh, to the table for the discussion, especially on, on such a good timing as the hearing was ju just held uh, last week. Uh, so we will be navigating here in, in this event between those two incidents as case examples uh, uh, when we make co a comparative analysis between the legal aspects of both jurisdictions, Brazil and England. And with that in mind, uh, I will actually uh, bring the word back to you, Celso, uh, and invite you to, and the other speakers as well, to comment a little bit on uh, which conventions you have in place uh, in your jurisdiction uh, and what are the legal and practical remedies uh, for fighting oil pollution that are available. So you'll be talking uh, about uh, UK and uh, an English perspective. And I think Ingrid will be adding something on the Brazilian side of that. Yes, before, before I, I, I pass it on to Renate and Ingrid, I'm just going to give you the background. Uh, the current international compensation, compensation regime in the UK is based on two conventions, the International Convention on Civil Liability of Oil Pollution Damage, the 1992 Civil Liability Convention, and the International Convention on the Establishment of an International Fund for Compensation for Oil Pollution Damage of 1992, which is called the 1992 Fund Convention. Uh, following, following the Eric and Prestige incidents, a third instrument, the protocol to the 1992 Fund Convention, the Supplementary Fund Protocol, was adopted in 2003, providing additional compensation over and above that available under the 1992 Fund Convention for pollution damages in states that become parties of the protocol. Uh, for today's purpose, we are only going to discuss the CLC and the 1992 Fund Convention, for, uh, but for completion under English law, I will just mention that there is also the International Convention on Civil Liability for Bunker Oil Pollution Damage of 2001, the Bunkers Convention, and for a pollution incident involving uh, um, oil carried as cargo or other pollutants such as hazardous and noxious substances, compensation is subject to establishing a, a valid claim under UK common law, and thereafter the amount uh, of available compensation is limited by a separate convention, the Convention on Liability uh, on Limitation of Liability of Maritime Claims of 1976, as amended by its protocol of 1996, the LLM C of 1996, which we are not going to discuss. So I'll, I'll just let, uh, I think it is uh, Renata first, is it? Yeah, thank you, Salsu. And I know it's a bit late, but thank you, Francesca, for the invitation as well. Um, so yeah, when we're talking about remedies and cover, I think it's also important to stress that a cooperation between the stakeholders is very important. And the ship owner, the club, the authorities, anyone impacted by a pollution incident, they all have the same goal and that is to deal with the crisis in the most effective way. Uh, to help their members meet their liabilities under the conventions and the local legislations. The IG clubs, and by IG clubs, I mean the clubs within the international group, they provide for very high levels of insurance for each ship that is entered and for each incident that can occur. So this high level of insurance is provided by means of a claims sharing agreement between the IG clubs and that comes in three blocks. The first block is a layer of insurance provided by the individual PNI club that is insuring the ship. So that club alone will provide insurance to its member for this part. This is known as the club's retention, and it goes up to 10 million US dollars for each particular incident. If a claim exceeds this first block, then it goes into the second one, and that is basically a cost sharing system between all the IG clubs, where they will contribute to the claims that go above the individual club's retention. This is the international group's pooling agreement, and it will cover amounts between 10 million and 100 uh, million US dollars. So whenever you hear people talking about pool claims, this is what they're referring to. If that is not enough to cover the ship's liability, then the claim enters into the third block, which extends the limit of cover provided by the IG clubs to 1 billion US dollars in pollution cases. This last block uh, will, will be covered by means of a collective purchase of reinsurance. And that is done by international group on behalf of the IG clubs and their members. And that is done every year. 
Now, these limits that I just mentioned, they are all available, but the ship's right to limitation is always taken into account. So even if you know, there is availability of cover up to a billion when it comes to pollution cases, the cap in a practical case will be the limitation amount provided by the CLC convention that Salsu has just mentioned. However, once the CLC limitation is exceeded, and that amount will vary according to the tonnage of the ship, the remaining damages to the victims of the oil pollution can still be paid out by the IOPC fund as long as certain criteria are met. And we don't have time to go through the, these criteria yet, but whoever is curious, you can look at a manual that the IOPC has on its website. And it's actually quite interesting. Now, the IOPC fund is a separate fund and has nothing to do with p insurance. This fund is paid by the countries that import oil and that have actually ratified the fund convention. Now, the limits of the fund, they will take into account the amount of oil received by the countries where the incident happens. Um, I believe today, the highest amount is around 420 million. And if the fund's limits are still not sufficient to cover the claims, then some countries can still count on the supplementary fund that has a higher limit of around 1.6 billion. But again, the countries must have ratified the supplementary fund protocol on top of the fund convention because it's not, it's not necessary to apply to, to ratify the, the supplementary fund. You have to also apply to it. Uh, now, remember that, you know, um, however, these limits are, uh, remember, however, that these limits that I just mentioned, they are on top of the CLC limits. So they are not, sorry, they are not on top of the CLC limits, but they take into account whatever was paid within the CLC limits. Uh, and the CLC limits will usually be much lower than the funds limits anyway. Um, those are the things I'd like to mention at this point on the IOPC funds. So I think I'll just pass it to Ingrid to comment on the remedies that are available in Brazil. Thank you very much, Renata. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, when you talk about remedies and what we have to fight pollution here, it's very important to start to mention our constitution the Brazilian constitution that established the triple liability for environmental damage. We, we are talking about civil, administrative and criminal liability. So we have a broad liability here in Brazil for environmental damage. And when you talk about remedies, of course, we need to mention some conventions, some international treaties uh, and highlighting the ones that here in Brazil, we are signed off and some national rules, of course. First of all, the International Convention of Oil Pollution and Response and Cooperation of 1990 uh, that encouraged all the states pilot to parties to develop and to maintain an adequate capability to deal with oil pollution emergencies. According to the OPRC convention, the parties must have containment plans in a lot of levels individual levels and national, and national levels. This convention even established some liability to ports and to vessels. So it's a really important convention to, to follow here in Brazil and we are part of it. In this, in this way, here in Brazil, we have a oil law of 2000, according to the OPRC convention that establishes uh, a creation of an individual emergency plan, an area plan that's a regional plan, and of course, a national contingency plan that must to deal with this individual and the area plan to have a, a fully efficient containment plan here in Brazil. It, of course, we need to highlight the Marco Convention. Of course, it brings a lot of measures to develop to bring to prevent the pollution here, like severe cargo registration book, the double hoops for vessels that are carrying oil, crude oil, segregate ballast water tanks. That's a great measure to prevent the oil and pollution, the pollution, the port facility, the, the other ports and terminal terminals must be prepared to receive waste, even crude waste. That's a really important point. And, and emergency plans, individual, regional, and national contingency plan. It's important to mention, just to top it off, uh, here in Brazil, we have a maritime court. So when we're talking about administrative liability, it's important to, to highlight 
a maritime court here in Brazil, they will trial every incident involving ships, vessels, ports, and terminals. Uh, the civil liability under the national environmental policy, there's a federal law here in Brazil, is an objective and unrestricted. It's a broad civil liability. So we under without prejudice of other sanctions, administrative and criminal sanctions, the polluter is obligated to identify or repair the damage caused to the environment and to other parties, of course. A lot of points are important also when you talk about civil liability, the flags, flags of convenience, and the convenience jurisdiction, when the party could choose where to fight, where to sue, um, aiming to have a better and a faster trial for the case. An extremely important point to achievement, the, the full achievement, the full civil liability here in Brazil, of course, just like Renata said before, relies on the compensation funds for the environmental damage, maritime damage, including oil and pollution, and to have a mandatory, insu mandatory insurance in cases like that. In this way, Brazil is part of the CLC 69, the International Convention of Civil Liability for Oil Pollution, the CLC 69, 69 that established a limited civil liability for the ship owner, but a mandatory insurance and a compensation fund then, of course, we're going to talk about it in this seminar, a lot of about it. And the sad news is that CLC 69 linked the contribution of a fund to a compensation of the OPC fund of 71, the, the older fund that, importantly, no, no longer exists since 2002 because of the fund 92, the CLC 92, the convention that we are, the Brazil, are not part of it. So until now, when you talk about civil liability, it's important to mention that here in Brazil, since we are not, we did not sign the CLC 92 convention, we do not have a compensation fund to help us with the resource that we need when we have an incident. But we have a lot of mandato mandatory uh, remedies, uh, in, including international convention and national laws like the oil law to try to fight and to prevent the pollution, including oil spills. I think that was it. And I would like to pass the word to Lucas for the next, next question, next point of conversation, Lucas. I, I shall now actually, yes, uh, I will before Talk going to, that's okay, before going to Lucas, uh, to passing on to Lucas, I think I should just ask Ingrid, why have certain convention not been ratified? And actually, what are the pros and cons in your views of adhering to such conventions? Great point, Francesca. We need to talk about why we, we didn't sign this international convention. Celso talked earlier about the bunker conventions, another convention that we didn't sign. The, the point is, of course, I agree, totally agree, that is convention that Brazil needs to sign. And I would like to point just two of them that we already talked about it here in the event to show how important it is to sign some treaties. The first one is the Bunker Convention that Celso talked about it just now and applies to damage, uh, inc including oil pollution, even in, in the exclusive economic zones of this, the, the party, the state's party, there's a, there's a protected zone. It's very important to mention that. We have also on the Bunker Convention, uh, the mandatory insurance to deal, to help, uh, like Renata said, and the liability for, pollu for damage, including oil and, and in maritime incidents, and the possibility to sue directly the insurance. It's three key points of the Bunker Convention that's very important to mention. We, do, we didn't have signed uh, the Wreck Removal Convention, but I won't talk about it right now. And the most important point is SLC 92, as we are talking. Uh, without any doubt, we didn't sign the CLC Convention. It, and of course, it represents a difficulty in the full civil liability, as we're going to see. The CLC 92 provides a compensation fund, uh, like a supplementary fund, for environmental damage, including oil spills, like a supplementary fund. 
that, that can be triggered in a specific situation. And the point is, we could trigger the supplementary fund, the fund convention here in Brazil, in the case that we were talking before with Lucas in, in the incident in 2019 that reached almost all the coast of Brazil. The Fund 92 will pay a compensation to states and to persons, of course, who suffer damage caused by oil pollution. If this, these persons cannot obtain compensation from the owner of the vessel, or the indemnity is not sufficient to cover all the damage. So uh, we need to trigger the fund convention in this specific situation. But why? Why Brazil didn't sign these conventions if it's so important to us? The first point is that convention allows the limitation of liability. And of course, it provides in the constitution of a fund, a supplementary fund, to be used to pay the indemnities, as we said before. The institution of limitation of liability is common, of course, is really common in maritime law, being, being really diffused in several conventions and, of course, in several others, national orders. Uh, but until now, Brazil, in Brazil, we don't have, we don't have an effective, effective global limitation regime. Uh, we're now trying to discuss uh, a new commercial code here and the limitation of liabilities is one of the bullets of the new commercial code that is in debate in our national congress. I, I think, I truly think that limitation allows quick and efficient repair in case of these disasters, in case of damage. And it's, re it's really important to highlight that our constitution established a broad civil liability, as I said before, an objective liability, unrestricted liability, but this li liability is not unlimited. So if you have a reasonable limitation, like even in the, in the words of Renata, there was not short amount or huge amount of compensations, uh, if you have a reasonable limitation based on the principle of the pollution must pay because of the, on the damage, must identify the environmental damage, is fully compatible with Brazilian legislation. So the fact that we have a, a limitation of the liability, of the civil liability, it shouldn't be seen as a difficult to cite some treaties because you're going to have more capability to deal with in a disaster like this, like that, like the, that, the, the prestige one, as Celso said, and that the oil spill, the rich Brazil. Uh, the good points, that's why we, we need to sign some international treaty, includes, include the rights to have, to count on a response team for, of support uh, that, that we didn't count here in Brazil in 2019, a qualified team to help us in, emergen, em, in an emergency case cleaning, compensation, even if the ship owner or the polluter is not identify, identified. That's very important point to highlight. Even when we do not identify who is liable for the accident, who was guilty for the accident, who is a polluter, we could reach the found, we can trigger the found to have the compensation in a qualifying team to help us and to support here. So the impression that remains is that the Congress uh, didn't, has not realized yet the importance of those conventions bring to major disasters here in Brazil. So uh, I think that we, surely, we truly must sign and study and sign the CLC, the Fund Convention, the Wreck Removal Convention, the Bunker Convention, among others. So thank you very much for the, the provocation for the, the question, Francesca. That's very important here for our country. I don't know if I, if I pass the word for Francesca again. I think we'll pass it on to Celso, to Celso, to Celso if that's okay. Yes, Celso, please, Luca, could, you, could you help us in this point? Lucas, are you going to make some comments before me or, or shall I start? Oh, I cannot add anything after what Ingrid said. It's just uh, basically she covered the well Lucas, the please don't be shy. <laughs> No, I think when you talk about limitation, yes, we, we indeed need to break that old uh, mindset that the limitation is against uh, moral aspects of law. Actually, as you uh, pointed out, it, it will bring 
certainty and efficiency to solving uh, things, as long as the, the limits are, are high enough that uh, it, they will not be uh, uh, they will not be reached in any incident, but actually in only very rare cases, uh, such as, as this one. So I think the limits are, are very considerable. It, they will not be uh, reached in all cases, so they will bring certainty. Uh, and as you pointed out, uh, having those conventions in place, if we did have them, uh, CLC in the fund convention, we certainly could have not only funding uh, to the incident we had in Brazil, even when the source was not identified, but also uh, uh, international assistance for cleaning up uh, technical efforts and actions and other remedies for to facilitate a prompt response and also compensate. So uh, I think it is something that we certainly need to take a look on that. So uh, that was uh, all I had to basically repeat what you said, Ingrid, and then uh, let's pass it to Celso to comment uh, uh, on their side of the story with the view on the prestige case. Yes, I would just add very briefly that, uh, I, I mean, I, we all agree on this, we, I, I struggle to see any disadvantage of uh, Brazil uh, signing the convention, because even, even uh, you know, even reviewing all the problems that uh, you may argue that existed after the prestige, uh, there was a fund for 170 million US, uh, euros available. Uh, and then in 2003, the, the, there was an additional fund that increased the limit. So now the limit, the, the limit uh, that, that is available is much higher. So you could argue that the, the, the limit before was, was, was perhaps low. Um, and, and if there are any issues of interpretation of the convention between the courts of the, the countries that are signatories, you know, all we need to do is to basically review the convention and, you know, and, and, and improve it and make it clearer. So I, I don't see uh, um, any major disadvantage uh, of Brazil signing the, the conventions. Uh, but uh, Henata, you were going to add some points as well. Yeah, thank you, Sal. So now I, I couldn't agree more with what was said here on the advantages of signing the conventions. I would like to add that the IMO conventions, they are widely used. They have been tested in many jurisdictions. Ingridi explained very nicely um, that the conventions, they have a systematic approach to hold the ship owner strictly liable for the pollution that is caused. The ship owner also has very few defenses available. And it is with the intention of bringing balance to this burden that the convention also provides for the right to limit liability. So it's not really a benefit, but it's all about compromising. And let's also remember, and, and this was already mentioned, I think, by Celso, that the limitation can be removed in some situations. So a guilty ship owner can still be liable to pay for complete damages. And as Celso nicely also reminded everyone, that does not apply to the club. <laughs> the club is always entitled to limitation. But uh, that doesn't mean that the, the victims of an oil spill will, will go unpaid. You know. And plus, the conventions, they are frequently reviewed and amended. This means that the limits of liability that apply to the pollution damages can also be increased as they actually have been. And Celso also touched upon this. Um, just a couple of points, really. Another positive aspect for the claimants, particularly with regards to CLC and bunker conventions, uh, is that they both require the ship owner to arrange and provide evidence of insurance. So the PNI clubs, they will certify that this insurance is in place. And by doing that, they will actually become directly liable to third party claimants. So this means that the, the third party claimants, they will actually be able to bring direct action against the clubs. What else do you need? <laughs> so the international group of PNI clubs strongly support the ratification of the IMO conventions uh, to regulate pollution coming from ships. And these conventions, they, they really do protect the affected states, they protect the local businesses, they protect the people, and they do it in a consistent way. Um, yes, that's all I'd like to add. I think now it's back to Lucas for our next question. Yes, Hanat, and actually I'll bring it back to you because uh, uh, you well pointed it out already, uh, but uh, I would just ask you kindly if you could elaborate a little bit more uh, on lessons to be learned out of those incidents, especially those two we are referring here now, uh, and what needs to be changed for future. 
Thank you, Lucas. Where to, where to start? Um, so we're, well, we've mentioned here today, you know, international conventions like MAPOL, that they were developed to protect the environment from wild pollution. We also mentioned other, other conventions like CLC that intend to regulate ship owner liability. They also ensure a prompt and efficient payment of compensation. Um, on a more practical note, when it comes to crisis management, we have learned that an early involvement in a prudent overreaction can often lead to a better and cost-effective results. And the clubs will always be prepared and always willing to contribute and assist. And they will always encourage their members to work together with the authorities, with other stakeholders in a proactive manner. And all we want to make sure is that a responsible approach is taken. And plus, there is an added benefit of having clubs and ship owners involved in, and that's because as, as long as they are part of the decision-making process and they have an opportunity to comment and to share experience, they will be less likely to question the actions taken and this will lead to more straightforward settlements and payments. And everyone, everyone has only you know, to gain from that. Um, I have, however, have you know, to make very clear here that this does not mean that the clubs are happy to write blank checks and that they will pay for all costs without asking any questions. My employers would be very angry at me if I gave you that impression. And as this is being recorded, I have to, <laughs> to make that comment. But as I just mentioned, there is much to begin in involving clubs and ship owners because you know, it will just make the whole process that much easier. They can and they will contribute to the best possible result. Uh, and, and I really like this, and this is something that a colleague of mine has always told me as a joint guard. It's not about trying to walk away. It's about taking responsibility, but also receiving a fair treatment as you do so. And in my view, this is what the conventions really stand for. And I, I do realize that this sounds very nice in paper, and I know we are in the real world. So none of this is possible if the parties don't actually trust each other. So another thing that we have learned is that by carrying out outreach programs where we organize events that aim not only to talk about and discuss important issues, but also and maybe more importantly, to, to get to know people, especially those people that are lined up to deal with an incident and it happens, the responsible authorities. Um, through those outreach programs, the clubs and the international group, they can actually you know, make good, worthy relationships. And it is one thing to meet people when you're at peacetime, it's another thing to meet them when there is a crisis. And I do get the point, you know, why would the authorities, why would those impacted by a spill trust a ship owner in their club when they're meeting for the first time during a horrible incident? I mean, why would they trust these people that, you know, did this to us? Uh, so it's much better to actually get to know one another beforehand. And then if and when this horrible incident does happen, an incident that nobody wants, and I think it's a very important thing to, to consider. Nobody wants these things to happen, but they do happen. But then if we all know each other, then those that are affected can actually take a bit of comfort in knowing that the people dealing with things, and they're going to do everything they can to achieve the best results possible because they know them. So again, you know, I think the, the major lesson learned is really that a good relationship between the stakeholders from the private and public sectors that can really make a big difference. And I think the international conventions, the IMO conventions, they help us get there and, and they help us achieve that. Um, that's what I would like to comment on this point, Lucas. Certainly, uh, and you're entirely right, Renata. Uh, and if I may add from a Brazilian perspective, we cannot uh, underestimate the risks of pollution. Uh, it is. It has been said a lot in the past that these kind of incidents would not happen in Brazil, that uh, the ocean currents and the tides would protect our coasts, and that was not what we saw uh, in, in the last event. Uh, and, and even though uh, our domestic uh, laws are very harsh on polluters in terms of liability, uh, I think we should still uh, bring some lessons, take out some lessons uh, from those last events uh, and see what we can improve 
we need to have all the resources and, and prepared uh, personnel to promptly respond to those spills. Uh, we need to have the, the government and the agencies acting promptly. And in the last spill, it took over one month before the, the government started to act, uh, before the first uh, oil started to appear on the beaches. It took long, even uh, some federal prosecutors in some states, they even went to court to, to provoke the government to respond. Uh, we need to have uh, better training and, and to respond uh, on a, a speedier uh, notice to, to put our contingency plans in place and uh, as Celso well mentioned, at least uh, uh, some of the conventions that were mentioned here, we certainly need to take a look on those conventions in Brazil to make amendments on our legal framework related to, to oil pollution and convince the, the legislative power and the government uh, on the risks of oil spills and the importance of ratifying the international conventions uh, if not all of those we've mentioned, at least I, I would start with uh, a CLC 92 and, and the Fund Convention. Uh, as Ingrid mentioned, we are a party to the CLC 69. It has never been applied though uh, in Brazil, uh, but we should uh, take a look in CLC 92. And actually I would like just to add the brief comment uh, that the Brazilian Navy has already submitted to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and, and to the government agencies in, in Brasilia, uh, uh, their intention, their suggestion for Brazil to adhere to the CLC 92. And they will subsequently do the, do the same thing for the Fund Convention. They decided to split and not submit both altogether, but to split. But that's the, the idea of the Navy. And certainly uh, it, it has a lot of support from the maritime community in Brazil. Uh, but that's the comments I have for, for now about this. And I would like to pass the word to Ingrid to add something. Thank you, Lucas. I will speak really quickly because you were very clear uh, about the lessons that we learned. But the first conclusion I think is that we are not really prepared to deal with major disasters. Now, that's the first and the sad conclusion that we can took from the lessons that we learned from the, the cases, the incidents that we passed here in Brazil, but we can keep going, of course. We know that in maritime incidents, we have like specific liabilities relating, relating to parties and specific acts to prevention. Uh, we cannot wait for the worst to happen to be prepared to deal with it. So I think it's really mandatory as for us to sign some treaties, but uh, it's important to mention another measures like we need to develop some instruments to have a compliance method to follow the mandatory rules in all aspects. We must address the root of the problem because here in Brazil, we have a good legislation. We have a really supportive legislation when you talk about environmental liability, a broad liability here, civil liability in incidents, in maritime and environment aspects. So we need to help the country to fall, to fall what's mandatory and to deal better in other cases, invest in technology, be smart, uh, improve our regulations, sign some international treaties, as I said before, like CLC, CLC the fund convention, rep removal, bunker convention, and have effective containment plans for both, for ships, for vessels, and for terminals, for ports. And in our courts must be also prepared to investigate, to, to judge, to trial uh, maritime incidents. We need to be able to find the liables and to determine who is liable for the incident. You know, since now we don't, we don't know who was the responsible, who's liable in the, in the incident of 2019. So we need to improve some, maybe some techniques of investigation, put a maritime court more uh, with the public ministry in this investigation together to try to find more resources. Uh, you see, when you have an incident, like Renata said, everybody depends on everybody. The good faith, I think, is the north of every act. And so when we talk about incident uh, in a national plan, the national contingency plan will need the regional, the area plan that will need the individual plan 
So everybody relies on everybody. So we need to, to have this, this action, the more cooperation to deal in, the, in, in accidents, in incidents, including oil pollution. But uh, we saw a lack of preparedness to deal with this, this oil pollution in a regional level, but we need to be prepared in a globalized world with standard of safety and efficiency with a quali quali qualified team to help us in a cooperation, a globalized level, with a mandatory insurance, like Renata said, compensation funds to deal, to, treat, to sign some treaties. And I think that's the, that's the way how to improve the lessons that we learn in this accident. So that's what I have to say. And I would like to pass the word to, to Francesca for her to add some things and to Thank you very much, Ingrid. Um, I, think, I think probably it would be quite interesting to see the UK perspective. So I, I would ask Celso if uh, you know, he thinks the remedies work well, and then perhaps he can pass it on to you again, and then we can have a comparison. Yes, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be very brief. I think that um, the, the operative word here is well. Has it worked well? I think that's in the case of prestige, uh, the, it worked well enough uh it is still uh, in dispute in, in hotly uh, you know disputed by both uh, the state of france the state of and uh, of spain and the the, the pni club we will see the end of the story probably within the next two three years um so it is not ideal to have a system that ends up with so much satellite litigation obviously um but it is better i would say it again it's better to have a a, a system of um you know, uh, shared sovereignty or shared pooling, uh, where there is some element of um, predictability and uh, commercial certainty for the parties, then to have a, a, a myriad of mixed systems that do not really even try to speak with each other. And, and, and I think that the conventions, they basically, you know, they, they provide this very important, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 feature uh, of, of, of in the compensation regime. Um, and I, I don't think that, uh, I don't think it is uh, it is perfect at the moment. It, it, you know, we could have uh, amendments to the convention. We could, you know, have protocols, additional protocols that make things clearer um, for to avoid this type of satellite um, mitigation in the future. But it's definitely the way forward because we have to, the last point I'll make, we have to remember the vast majority of uh, uh, pollution, you know, oil pollution by tankers, which is what this addresses, these conventions address, um, uh, they, they occur by single uh, entity owned vessels. So, you know, the, they, they, the only recourse is by the by the 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 uh, the 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 the, dam the 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 lot by the damaged parties uh, is to the insurance because the the maximum value of the of that particular vessel is the value of the vessel. There isn't any additional, you know, the, the, these vessels they are not they are not owned usually not owned by, you know, one company. They own several several hundred vessels. So the only realistic way of uh, of uh, obtaining some uh, you know, level of compensation from a pooled resource is via the conventions. But uh, I, I know that Ingrid has some additional comments to make. Thank you, Celso. Uh, did the remedies work well? That's a really nice question. Uh, we know that according to OPRC convention, we need all the party, all the states have, must have a national and regional emergency plan. Here in Brazil, we said before, we have our oil law, with that established emergency plan, area plan, they are consolidating in a national contingency plan. So we need to, all these plans should be connected to help us in to deal in an incident like the one we have in 2019. But what we saw is that unfortunately the plans, especially the national one and the regional one, were not effective, were not prepared to be actionated, to be triggered in a case like that. Um, but we need to highlight that in a case like that, the states and environmental bodies were not prepared because we're dealing with a unique and a challenging incident. We didn't know the source of the spot of pollution, the type of oil. 
uh, that were even more dense and difficult to contain. It was underwater. We didn't, we couldn't see that very much, very, very easily. And we didn't know that who, is, who was liable uh, to deal with the cases. So we need all the sources, all the, 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 li the liabilities were come from the states and the environmental bodies. But the national plan, the national contingency plan took more than a month to go in force. So it didn't go that fast as we needed in the case in the incident. And it was, it were the more suitable plan to trigger in cases uh, where we don't know the, the, the liables, the responsible parties, and where the pollution comes, comes from. So it was the suitable plan to, to trigger in the accident of 2019. And many states did not have the reg regional, the area plan that should help the national contingency plan. And we have also a lack of resource because we didn't have a compensation fund. We didn't have a, a qualified team to come here and to help us to deal with the incident. Uh, so here in Brazil, even we found advanced legislation in maritime and in environmental law with uh, broad civil liability, as we said before, I really believe that some measures ended being really inefficient. Uh, so, but if we were a signatory of this convention that we are talking about, the CLC, the Fund Convention, even without identifying the, the liable one, we could trigger the compensation and to have some help to deal in the case. Uh, so to conclude my, my thought for effective liability, civil liability on maritime pollution is really necessary to have containment and efficient containment plans, including individual, area, regional plan, national contingency plan, they must be effective and we need to have cooperation on all the levels, federal, states and, and individual levels. And Brazil really need to sign some treaties or to develop a, a national fund here for, for the convention. So we, I, I think the lessons and the remedies were good, but not that effective, Francesca. I see, thank you very much, Ingrid. And I think uh, now we, we shall perhaps ask the audience if there is any questions. Um, please feel free to unmute yourself and you know ask the question. Otherwise, I do have a question. I think Lucas has a question as well, but uh, perhaps we should give a couple of seconds. If I may, Francesca, I would indeed have a question to, to Ingrid, because you are there in the front, uh, the center of where all the, the pollution started to appear in the Brazilian coast. If it was to happen again, and God forbid is not thinking of that, but we need to be prepared. But if it would happen again, uh, do you think the, the response would be in any way different or we will be just facing the same kind of delayed and uh, unconcentrated responses. Thank you, Lucas, for the, the question. And unfortunately, I have, I have a sad answer. <laughs> if it happens again, just right now, I think the, all the, the force, the, the actions will be just the same. We didn't uh, develop any instrument that's different we don't have uh, effective plans yet. We don't have this cooperation that's really mandatory to have effective containment plans. We need to be more smart when you talk about vessels, when you talk about ships, we need to have fund conventions. See, Brazil right now uh, occupies the 10th position of the global ranking of oil production. We are in the top, we are in the top 10. We are in the 10th position of global ranking oil production. And how come we don't have a fund convention? Uh, even in our uh, national rule, in national order, we could have a, a, a mandatory compensation in here in Brazil, a national order, but we don't have it here. And we, we hadn't signed some convention that puts it in, in, as a mandatory. We have to open our mind to the possibility to have limited liability in cases like that. So we have mandatory insurance that we can trigger, we can, we can sue directly, we can have more insurance, more, 
more safety to deal in this in this accident. We need to have a qualified team to help us. We need to have resource to deal with incidents like that. So, uh, if they have, if the, we had an incident just like the one, without knowing the source, without knowing what kind of oil are reaching our beaches, because we we don't know yet. We have some ideas, but we don't know the DNA of the oil yet. We don't know where it came from, who 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 is liable for it, where is uh, where is the the source of pollution. So we don't know much of the incident, and we didn't develop our mandatory rules here in Brazil or sign some treaties to have a different perspective of the cases. So unfortunately. I think we we have the the same sad conclusion as, we, but I, I really hope we don't have a case like that again here. See, Lucas. Indeed, but we need to be prepared. And I, I've we been need to watching. Be I've been watching here in the chat. We have been receiving support. The idea that Brazil indeed needs to ratify the conventions. And actually, this is uh, uh, an interesting question from a colleague of mine, Tarik, uh, in the office. Uh, Tarik, you would like to to address the question, or can I do it? Um, I think I can do it. Uh, all right. Oh, I'd like to congratulate you all for the for the participation in this event. It's been really interesting to, to see all the discussions. Um, I would like to, to direct my, my question to Renata, um, because it is well known that uh, in Brazil, environmental damages, they're not subject to any financial limitations as has been discussed in here before. Um, but in addition to that, they're also uh, not subject to any time limitations as the courts, uh, they usually understand that environmental damages are permanent. So how does that lack of, of time limitation um, affect the coverages provided by the club? And if you had had any problems in the past in this regard or, or in Brazil or, or with other jurisdictions as well? Yeah, thank you, Tarek. Um, it's a difficult question. I think you, you hit the nail in the head <laughs> as they say it. Well, unfortunately, it is difficult to deal with environmental cases in Brazil. Uh, we are very well aware of the lack of, of limitation periods for certain types of environmental claims. There's also, as you said, no limitation of liability. That doesn't really change the cover that the member has available because there are rules you know, for cover with the members. So as I mentioned before, the pollution, the, the liability for pollution, the claims for pollution, they are capped at 1 billion. And, you know, that will work for Brazil as it will work for other jurisdictions that have ratified the conventions. So that works about the same. The great challenge is actually on the claims handling, on how to try to reach the best cost effective solution without incurring a lot of costs. And when a country doesn't provide for a limitation of liability, before the easiest or, or the, the position would be, well, let's fight this to the end. Let's fight this in court for, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I can see, at least in my experience, and I don't mean to speak, you know, for all the clubs and, and the AG, but at least I have seen certain attempts that I think are working in the sense that, you know, companies have been trying to approach um, the, the, the claimants and those claimants could be private claimants, like, for example, fishermen. Um, and could be also the authorities because they also seek compensations and they also impose fines. So lately, we've been attempting to, to try and reach amicable solutions and trying to actually discuss with them because once you, you treat these people with respect and once they understand that you're trying to take responsibility, but also they have to understand that there has to be a limit because otherwise, you know, a lot of people can go without. So it's better to, to share the funds so that everybody gets a bit rather than having some people being compensated and some not being compensated. So this is a very good question. It's a question that we could discuss for about an hour, but I hope with these comments, I have at least addressed a little bit and, and given you an idea of how we've been approaching. But again, this is something that we've been trying to do. It's not necessarily how every club and you know every sheep owner will address the issue, but it's something that we've seen it has been working lately. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renata.
Okay, I think that we now have, unless there are more questions, probably hand back, we're over an hour, so we're all very conscious of the time uh, that we have spent today. Uh, so I, I shall pass the word, pass the handle back to Lucas, if that's okay, for some final comments. All right, thank you. Uh, after all, we, we've sat and discussed, and we, of course, could spend uh, much more time here discussing this such uh, relevant topics. Uh, but uh, some, for our final words, I would like to mention that uh, normally the shipping industry, and, and it's not different in other industries as well, much, but taking the shipping industry as an example, we learn a lot from practical cases, from incidents uh, that happen. That, uh, we could see that uh, when we had the uh, Solus Convention uh, coming after the Titanic incident, uh, Marpol, after the Torrey Canyon incident, it was uh, OPA in the US after the Exxon Valdez. And, and it is not different in Brazil. Um, Ingrid mentioned the, the Brazilian oil law of uh, 2000. That law was uh, in the National Congress under discussion for over a decade. And it only came out in the year 2000 because uh, in that same year, there was a major incident of pollution in the Guanabara Bay in Rio, uh, pollution arising out of a, a terminal from Petrobras. And that pollution incident uh, made the National Congress uh, approve the law in such a hurry. Uh, after the BP incident in the Gulf, Brazilian authorities were aware in monitoring and discussing the event. Uh, one or two years later, we had uh, an incident with Chevron uh, in the exploration in some oil fields in Brazil. Uh, and that also accelerated the enactment of the National Contingency Plan that Ingrid also mentioned. Uh, National Contingency Plan was also being discussed in the Congress for almost 10 years. And it was approved right after the incidents happened. Uh, so I at least uh, expect that if we couldn't find the source uh, uh, of these last pollutions, at least we learn the lesson and we uh, take a look in the conventions in uh, developing even further our legislation so that we can be well prepared uh, if it happens in the future. So it is, uh, that's why, and just to wrap up, I think it is uh, very uh, important to have events like that uh, for which uh, I uh, appreciate uh, YMP and the Brazilian Bar Association and all the participants and attendees uh, to, to be here discussing that because uh, this kind of discussion is important also so that we can take the message to the Brazilian authorities and to the humanitarian community uh, on the importance of dealing with sub subjects. Uh, so that's it uh, uh, from my side. Uh, I'd just like you to ask if uh, Ingrid, Celso, Renata, or Francesca, if you have any final words to add, feel free to do that. Everybody's really polite here, waiting for the, the next one to start. So I will be very, very quickly here. Thank you, Lucas. I would like to thank Francesca, Francesca, Celso, Renata, and Lucas for the for the seminar. For me, it was was very important. I'm glad to participate. Uh, and I would like to highlight our concern with our environment here in Brazil, maritime environment here in Brazil, even because we are we are aiming to open the market to the cabotage market to international vessels with different flags. So we need to be more concerned about uh, uh, the, the, the navigable and the, the and environmental here. Uh, we need to sign some treaties. We need, of course, we need to have some funds to put the contingency plans in place, be effective, uh, to have resources to deal and train people, qualified people to help us here. Uh, in the in accidents like that. So thank you very much. Uh, congratulate Francesca and Lucas for the co coordinating this event, all the speakers, and wish all the best. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Ingrid. And you know, for me, I, I'll be very, very brief, but I'd like to thank you all from Brazil. And uh, of course, Lucas in particular, he has done an excellent job. And all of you, we've had many meetings, it's been quite 
challenging, but you know, obviously it's one of the plus of the pandemic. We would have probably never had uh, been able to run an event jointly from Brazil at the same time. It would have been much, much more difficult, but of course we hope to keep uh, the relationship going. And uh, of course, perhaps we have the next event, who knows, either in London or, uh, or in Brazil. So I, I thank you, of course, um, God, the club and uh, Celso for all their efforts as well. And of course, all the participants. Many thanks. Cheers. Thank you all. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.